Hello and welcome to this webinar focusing on effective study strategies and this webinar is designed and aimed at parents and carers of children who are secondary age, ages 11 to 18. Now these study strategies can apply to learners of all ages but I've decided to have slightly more of a secondary focus. And the fact that you are here listening to this webinar about effective study strategies shows that you really do care about your child and about their education and that you want to help them as much you can as much as you can. So they are very lucky to have you as their parents and carers. And before I begin, I will just briefly introduce myself. I'm Kate Jones. I am an experienced teacher. My main subject is history, but I've taught other subjects, politics and geography and drama and Welsh. So that's uh, <laughs> had a very interesting career. I've also been a leader in schools. I currently am now a senior associate for evidence-based education, although currently I am on maternity leave. Um, but I really wanted to deliver this presentation. I hope it can be helpful for parents. I'm a best-selling author. I've authored several books, as you can see, with a few more books on the way. And four of those books focus on retrieval practice. And that is one of the effective study strategies that I will be talking about today. And if you would like to stay in touch with me, and I hope you do, please do get in touch with me, either with some feedback or with any questions you might have. I'm on social media at Kate Jones underscore teach. So the aims of the session today is, first of all, I hope that you gain an understanding of what the effective and efficient study strategies are. Now, these are strategies that teachers will be using in classrooms with students to help them learn and to make progress and to support them. These are also strategies that students can use independently at home or that you can use with them to support their studies. It's also important to be able to recognize and identify the ineffective study strategies because there are some strategies and techniques that are better than others. And the research supports this. My experience as a teacher supports this as well. And it's important that parents are familiar with the ineffective study strategies so that if their child is using these strategies at home, they can then intervene and help them use their time more wisely. Um, and the final thing is I hope you leave this session today with some techniques and tips and ideas, things that you can use at home to support your child. But before we look at the study strategies, I'm just going to touch upon motivation. You might be very fortunate and your child might love studying and they enjoy completing homework. Some children do, and that's wonderful. But don't worry if your child doesn't and they struggle um, because that's also common as well. So a good starting point, especially if your child is in an exam year, for example, they, they're going to do their GCSEs or their A-levels, a good question would be to start with why. Why do they want to do well? Why do they want to be successful? And this is inspired by Simon Sinek. He's a very famous author, TED Talk speaker. Um, this is something that he talks to leaders about. What's your why? What gets you, you know, motivated? What drives you to do well? And if your child doesn't know, again, that's okay. They can go away and think about this and reflect on this question. It might be that they want to do well in their GCSEs so they get the grades to study the A-level courses or if they're at A-level, they need the grades to go to their desired choice of university. Perhaps it could be that there's a specific career that they want to follow, and they need the grades to help them get to where they want to be. I can recall uh, when I was a young child that my dad had said to me quite openly that he didn't really enjoy his job, um, but he didn't feel like he had that many options. And he said, Kate, when you're older, really try and find a job that you love because you spend a lot of time working. So if you can find something that you enjoy, then that will make your life a lot better. Uh, and that, that stuck with me. And that was my why. And I love teaching. That was my first book, Love to Teach. And I still love teaching. That's why I'm doing things like this webinar so that I can hopefully help students and, and families uh, and teachers and so on. 
So start with why. And let's take it from there. So in terms of the study strategies, not all study strategies are equal. And this is important because I've experienced students who have sat a mock exam, a trial exam, an assessment, and they have been bitterly disappointed. And they're confused because they know they've revised and they studied and they've put the time in. So why didn't they do as well as they hoped? And I've also had conversations with parents where they're baffled because they say, Miss Jones, I know my child studied. I saw them revising. Why didn't they do well on the final exam? Now, there's lots of reasons for this, but one of the reasons could be the study strategies that they were using. How did they study and when did they study? And that tends to be the first question that I ask. Now, I don't have enough time today to go into depth about all the different research studies and papers. I do that in my books. I reference them. But this is an evidence-informed strategy. So the advice that I'm giving and sharing is based on a lot of very reliable and rigorous research. And if you don't believe me or trust me, you can contact me and I can point you in the right direction. I would recommend reading, reading Strengthening the Student Toolbox by Professor John Dunlosky. Now, that was originally published in 2013 by Dunlosky and his colleagues at Kent State University, where they looked at 10 popular study strategies and students use these strategies and then completed assessments. And through their studies and their findings, they found that there were some strategies that were more effective than others, and they were able to rank them in order of effectiveness and utility. Now, even though that was in 2013, in 2021, Professor John Hattie and Gregory Donoghue published a meta-analysis. So this is where they look at different um, research studies and papers. And they came to the same conclusion as Dunlosky about what the effective study strategies are, what the less effective study strategies are. And it's important that teachers, students and parents are aware of these so that we can all make sure that we are using our time wisely, whether that's in the classroom or outside of the classroom, and ultimately to help children learn. So we're going to begin with the ineffective strategies, because as I've said, I believe it's really important that parents are aware of the ineffective strategies so that they can intervene at home. If they see their child using these techniques, they can say stop why don't you use this technique instead? This is better. This is more efficient. This is more effective. And the techniques that I'm about to share with you and the strategies that are described as ineffective, they may be strategies that you used and perhaps they worked for you. And actually, I'm the same. Uh, I achieved straight A's at A-level. Uh, I did very well. And I use these strategies but I spent a huge amount of time, effort and energy revising. It was exhausting, it was challenging, it was stressful. So of course any revision is better than no revision. But if I knew about these ineffective strategies versus the effective strategies, I could have used my time more wisely. I could have spent more time with friends and family and exercising and not dedicate every single minute and moment to revision. So let's tackle these before we look at the effective study strategies. And the first one might shock you because it's very popular with students and that's highlighting. Students love to highlight their notes. But as you can see here, students sometimes highlight everything. And if everything is highlighted, then technically nothing is highlighted. And an example that I give my students is about an actor. Now, this is different to teaching and learning in the classroom, but the example works and feel free to share it. So when an actor receives a script, the first thing they might do is highlight their lines. Now, just because they've highlighted their lines, does that mean they know their lines now? Of course it doesn't. They've just highlighted the lines they need to learn. And then they need to spend time reading the script, rehearsing the script. And the only way they will know if they've mastered their lines is if they can recall the lines from memory without looking at the script. So the same applies to students. Just because something has been highlighted 
It doesn't mean that they now know it and they can recall it later in an exam. And this is what we call a poor proxy for learning. Just because something is highlighted doesn't mean it's been learned. And if parents see beautifully colored notes, they may think understandably, oh, my child's done lots of great revision. Look at all the highlighted information. But that doesn't mean that the information that they've even understood it and that they can recall it when they need it. Now, highlighting can be used, but just as a starting point. So students could use highlighters to highlight key dates, key quotes, key vocabulary. But then what do you do with the highlighted information? Highlighting alone is not enough. And the same applies with underlining. It's exactly the same principle. Highlighting and underlining are quite easy to do. They don't require much mental effort. And we could see why students probably enjoy highlighting, making their class notes look bright and colorful and beautiful. And it's not too challenging. But these are the strategies we, we need to steer our, our children away from. Another ineffective uh, strategy, which may surprise you, is rereading. Now, I don't mean revisiting class notes. So if, especially if students do a two-year course, for example, you're in year 11 and you need to go back and revisit the content that you studied in year 10. That's, that's of course, natural and that's a good idea to do. To reread and revisit is helpful. But to have a page and to reread it over and over again, that's not effective. Now, the students may feel a sense of familiarity with the text because they've been reading it and reading it and reading it. And it might give them a false sense of confidence. But when they're in the exam, they may struggle to recall that information because the rereading hasn't helped to secure that information in their long term memory and make it recallable. So we can do rereading and revisiting, but to a point. And again, what you do with the information instead of rereading it, you can do something better. Cramming is another very popular technique. Um, uh, I crammed at times in university and this was due to a lack of organisation. Um, I did get better um, by the time I was in my third year. I realised cramming was not effective. Now, some people say they, and students have said this to me, cramming works for me. Cramming works perhaps in the long term, but cramming is really stressful. Cramming is where you leave your revision to the last minute and often students have to study a large amount of content in a short amount of time. So therefore you can really feel the pressure. Students may even resort to then staying awake all night cramming, drinking energy drinks and caffeine. And again, they are not good things to do before you've got an exam. So a way to avoid cramming really is to be organized and prepared and start your revision earlier. And I will talk about that later with space practice. So oh, there is an argument and your child may say, well, I like highlighting, be reading, underlining, and surely at least I'm revising. But if you're going to spend 30 minutes or 60 minutes studying, surely you want to spend that time wisely using the most effective, efficient strategies. If you use these techniques, you will need to study for longer. And in terms of confidence and level of guarantee of being able to recall the information later, I, I wouldn't want to risk that. I would want to spend my time using an effective strategy and feel confident in the exam that I can recall the information that I need. So these are not challenging. They might be enjoyable and popular, but we do have to try uh, and get students away from these. And that's why I also do work with primary schools and I work with students in year seven because I want students from as young an age as possible to develop really good study habits and routines. As a classroom teacher, when I've been trying to tell students who are 16 or 17 to not highlight and to use different techniques and strategies, it's been quite difficult because they may have got used to these techniques and they rely on them. So, but we've got to be resilient and keep going and keep pushing the effective study strategies.
Now, something else, this is in still under the category of ineffective, <laughs> is a few myths that I want to bust. You may have heard of learning styles. And when I trained to be a teacher in 2009, um, myself, my, my um, colleagues, the trainees, we were told that we should plan our lessons to cater for the different learning styles, that children learn in different ways. And we should have different activities to suit their different styles because that will help them learn. Now, as you can imagine, from a teaching perspective, that was a nightmare. It was really difficult in terms of workload, trying to plan a kinesthetic task, a visual task, something for the auditory learners. The belief was that it would help them learn better. And that's the myth. And there is no research or evidence to support this. And it has been well and truly debunked. If you'd like to watch a video where this has been debunked, then type into YouTube learning styles and Daniel Willingham. He's a cognitive scientist who explains why this is not something that we should we should follow or adopt in classrooms or for studying. Students may think that they learn best in a certain way. That's not true. The grain of truth with learning styles is that you may have a preferred way of learning. And that's why I have the pizza and the apple. I prefer to eat pizzas over apples, but just because I prefer it doesn't mean it's better for me. The apple is better for me. And actually we're all the same in terms of our diet. We might all have different preferences. We might have some different allergies, but generally speaking, everyone, the apple is the healthier option and pizza isn't. And when it comes to learning, we are not that different. The effective study strategies apply to all students of different ages, across different subjects, different abilities, and so on. So the belief that, oh, I learned best doing this, no, actually, you might like that more, doesn't mean that you learn better that way. Another myth, <laughs> which is always an interesting one, and again, there's lots of research published to support this, is about multitasking, the multitasking myth. Um, and you might think, well, I multitask. I regularly do two things at once. And let me give you an example. You might drive to work every day and listen to the radio or talk to someone in your car. I'm doing quite a lot of things. I'm driving, I'm keeping an eye on the road, I'm having a conversation. Surely that's multitasking. Well, if you drive to work every day the same route, it's automatic to you. It's like autopilot. So therefore, you can have the conversation and you can still be aware. But if you're driving perhaps on the motorway, a brand new journey, somewhere you've never been before, and you know eventually there's an exit coming up that you have to take, then you might say to the people in the car, can you just be quiet so I can concentrate? You might turn the radio down. So when something requires cognitive processing, that's when we have to devote our full attention to it. The other thing that can happen with multitasking is rapid switch tasking, where you go from one thing to another. So if your child says to you, I can multitask, I can revise and watch Stranger Things on Netflix. No, they can't, because actually they'll either be what looking up at Netflix and then studying and perhaps switch tasking. Or the research has also shown that when people multitask, they make mistakes and errors and they drop the ball. And I've had this in the classroom where students say, miss, I can talk to my mate and do the classwork. And again, they're either switch tasking, talking, then working very quickly, or they're doing the work whilst talking and then they forget the full stops, the capital letters, they spell words wrong. It's best to fully concentrate on one task and then move on to another. So studying and then watch Stranger Things or vice versa. But that's something to be aware of. You may also have seen this pyramid that floats around on the internet. Again, it's been well and truly debunked. Someone that I know and admire is called Pedro de Bouquier, and he's written a lot about why this, <laughs> this is not something that we should pay attention to. And hopefully, if you haven't seen this, I don't mean to draw attention to it, but I just want to clarify a few things. The learning pyramid suggests that the best way to learn is by teaching others. Now, actually, that really doesn't make sense, because how can you learn something new by teaching it to somebody if you don't know it already? If you're a novice, then you're not in a position to teach others. 
So that doesn't make sense. It's also believed that this data and the percentages are bogus. We don't know where they came from. There is something that we can perhaps take away from this. So if students have understood a concept, they've been taught it thoroughly, they get it, it could be a useful study strategy to teach somebody else. And that could be you, their parent. They could tell you about something because by doing that, they're recalling the information from long-term memory. And you could do this perhaps every day after school where you ask your child, um, what lessons did you have today? English. Oh, and um, what are you studying in English? Romeo and Juliet. Can you tell me about the main characters? Can you tell me about the themes? Can you summarize the plot for me? And those questions will help the student to practice, rehearse and retrieve the information. But it it has to be once they've mastered that knowledge and they have that knowledge. So if you see this floating around, just ignore it. So we focus on the ineffective. Let's get on to the effective study strategies. And there's two really effective study strategies that I'm going to focus on. But there's lots of different ways that you can embrace them. And the first one is the topic of my four books, something I'm very passionate about. If you're on my YouTube channel, you will see lots of presentations about retrieval practice. This is the act of recalling information from long-term memory. So you can only retrieve something from long-term memory if it got to your long-term memory in the first place. So you can't ask your child a question, obviously about something that they haven't been taught yet. It has to be the things that they've taught and they've, they've been understood in class. This can be quizzing, this could be flashcards, this could be games, this could be past papers. There's lots of different ways that we can use retrieval practice in the classroom and at home. The second strategy is space practice, the opposite of cramming. This is about being organized, spacing out your study, doing little and often over time. So retrieval practice is the how you study and spacing is when you study. And the beauty of this is that they can be combined together. You can have spaced retrieval practice and then that really will be effective. So what is retrieval practice? Well, I've got a question for you. What is the capital of Kenya? I'm about to show you the answer. Nairobi. Now, three things might have happened. You might have said Nairobi instantly. You knew it. You retrieved the answer successfully. Well done. Perhaps I didn't give you enough time. And perhaps you said, oh, I know this. Wait a minute. And then the answer flashed up and you recognised it. It was there in your long-term memory. You just didn't have the time or perhaps you didn't have the confidence with your answer. The third thing is you just didn't know. And that's okay. You didn't know the answer was Nairobi. So you couldn't retrieve it from your long-term memory. Now, retrieval practice is exactly this. Pulling information out of your long-term memory if it's there in long-term memory. And Professor Robert Bjork is one of the world leading experts in memory. And I've had the privilege to talk to Robert Bjork and his wife, Elizabeth Bjork. I've interviewed them. I've co-authored an article with Robert Bjork. Again, if you want to find out more about memory and the research behind it, uh, you can visit their web uh, page, The Forgetting Lab, or type Robert Bjork UCLA into YouTube. And a quote I love from Robert Bjork is, using your memory shapes your memory. Using your memory changes your memory. Now, I like to tell my students, using your memory improves your memory. Every time information is recalled from long-term memory, that information, that memory is altered so that it becomes easier to recall next time. That memory is now more accessible, easier to retrieve. And that's why we keep retrieving the information so that by the time students are in their final exam, their retrieval strength is high and retrieval strength high means that you can retrieve information quickly, confidently and correctly. If your retrieval strength is low, you can often retrieve things, but it might be slow, difficult. You might not be sure or perhaps you don't retrieve it because even though it's in your long term memory, you just can't bring it to mind. So we want students to be doing lots and lots of retrieval so that when they need the information, they can recall it, they can remember it with ease, with speed and with confidence. 
So retrieval practice is an effective teaching and learning strategy that we can use inside or outside of the classroom. This can help children learn, but adults too. So if there's something that you want to learn, whether it's a language or whether it's something related to your job, then trust me, embrace retrieval practice. Retrieval practice, as I've said, is all about getting the information out of long-term memory. And this is one of the challenges that teachers have. We have to get the information into long-term memory. So we have to teach it and explain it and check for understanding. We want it to transfer from working memory to long-term memory. But then that's not enough. We then need to see if students can retrieve it from long-term memory as well to strengthen their memory, make progress and overall just improve learning. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, asking students to recall things from memory, isn't that just like an exam? It is different. Retrieval practice is all about learning and improving your memory so that, yes, hopefully by the time we come to a formal exam, this will have helped immensely. But if your teacher, your child's teacher uses retrieval practice every single day, it's not an exam factory. They're not having a high stakes exam. Now, in one of the schools I worked at, and this is my mistake, by the way, I had a parent send me an email and say, Miss Jones, uh, my child does not like your history lessons anymore. And you give them a test every lesson. And this is really causing my child a lot of stress. They come home and they say, another test in history. And their child also had learning difficulties. So again, this was really difficult. And I was really alarmed by this email. So I met with the parent and the child and I explained to them what retrieval practice is and what it isn't. And I said, when we do these quizzes and activities, they are not exams. When you use a mini whiteboard and write your answer down, I just scan. I don't make a note of your score. I don't put all the results on a spreadsheet. It's low stakes. This is very different to high stakes. High stakes is where you, know, you do a formal exam, you get a grade, and that's it really, it's quite final. On a retrieval quiz, if you don't know, that's okay. You've shown me that there's a gap in your knowledge, so that's going to help me with my lesson planning, that I need to go over that again because a few of my students have forgotten. But you're not in trouble. It's not going on a school report. It's not an issue because forgetting is normal. It happens to everyone. Nobody is immune from forgetting. So teachers don't often record um, the results or send them home to parents because that would then make it high stakes and stressful. You can also, with retrieval practice, provide a hint or a cue. That might not make retrieval practice as effective, but you, you can do that. That's absolutely fine. And you can play games. You can have a quiz. And there's lots of people who go to quizzes for fun. Um, it is different if you're in a, a group rather than as an individual, but there is something very enjoyable, satisfying and rewarding when you can recall information correctly. It's a great feeling. I see that when my partner answers questions on University Challenge and he's really proud. <laughs> um, and they're often really difficult questions and he does have a sense of achievement about that. So there's lots to enjoy about retrieval practice. So what are the different types of retrieval? Well, in terms of in the classroom, the teacher might use multiple choice quizzing or short answer questions. Um, this can be online. There's lots of great websites out there. There's Quizlet, there's Carousel Learn, Kahoot and so on. Multiple choice tends to be the easiest type of retrieval because the answer is there for the student to select. So again, that's less stressful, something you don't often see in formal exams. Retrieval doesn't have to be written. It can be verbal recall. So that conversation that you have with your child where they tell you about what they've been learning, that's verbal retrieval practice. It could simply be writing down from memory everything they can, answering questions or writing about a topic. Um, we use mini whiteboards in school. Now, they are very low stakes. Students will have a dry away, a raised board, a whiteboard. They write the answer on, hold the board up, teachers quickly scans, checks the room, and then they rub their answer off. Completely different to a formal exam where you would sit in silence in time conditions, being monitored. It's just write your answer on a whiteboard and, and then rub the answer off. 
and lots of games and activities where it's all about getting the information out of long-term memory. And there's lots of benefits. First of all, the research is very clear. And there is a research paper about the 10 benefits of the testing effect, which is retrieval practice. And the main academic benefit is that it's been shown time after time to help learners make progress, that they can then know more and remember more. And I have seen this for years where students absolutely flourish and they grow in their confidence and they can now remember things that they couldn't remember a while back. And that's because of the retrieval practice. This is helpful for the student, the teacher and parent. Retrieval practice does what highlighting and underlining and rereading doesn't. It shows where there are gaps in knowledge. If you can't remember something, then there's that's where there's a gap in your knowledge. It might be that perhaps you're absent or you didn't really understand it or your retrieval strength is just low. But knowing where there's a gap in your knowledge is very powerful because then you could say, oh, right, okay, well, I've got loads of time until my exam. This is the bit I need to focus on and close this knowledge gap. So retrieval practice shows you what you know, what you can recall, and it shows you what you don't know and you need to focus on next. Again, there's research to support this, but I've seen it in my own classroom. Regular research has, uh, sorry, research has shown that regular retrieval practice can lead to an increase in student confidence and a decrease in student anxiety. So this is fantastic for their well-being and also their motivation. When students realize retrieval practice works, then they are more likely to embrace it as a strategy and they will recognize this is what I should be spending my time on because this works. And as I've said, it can be enjoyable and fun. So how can we use retrieval practice at home? Well, ask your children questions about the content. Now, I, I have a stepdaughter and a stepson, as well as my two-month-old newborn baby. And I might say, how was school? And often my stepdaughter tells me about the personal side. So, oh, I've met some new friends. This is what happened at lunchtime. And all that is really interesting because I have an interest in their life. But that's not retrieval practice in terms of the school content. So then I might say, well, what are you studying in history? OK, well, what did you find out today? What can you tell me about that person? And that is the retrieval practice. Now, you could do that even if you're not sure. Or what you could do is go on your school website where there should be an online curriculum, which will tell you about the topics. It may have more information about the curriculum or check the Google Classroom. You could even ask the teachers if there's quizzes that parents can use. And there might be a set of questions that parents can ask their child and the answers are provided as well. One of the things that parents keep telling me is they lack the confidence to do this because they might not have the knowledge themselves about a certain topic. But that's OK, because, again, it's your child there to teach you and you're helping them to retrieve the information you can use the child's textbook or class books to read it and say, oh, tell me what, what year this happened or tell me what this quote means. So don't let that put you off asking questions. Um, you could ask about key vocabulary. Um, have you learned any new words? Tell me what it means and, and talk about it from there. Um, encourage your child to quiz themselves. So instead of rereading their notes, they could have their notes and they could design questions, write the answers. They wait, they then complete the quiz later and then they check their answer sheet. If they might already have quizzes that their teachers have made them, that, are, that they've used in class, that are on the Google Classroom or online. But again, one of the key things that parents can do is intervene. If your child, first of all, if they're not studying, then you can encourage them to do something and you can point them in the right direction with retrieval practice. If they are studying, but they're highlighting and rereading, then tell them, say, I attended this webinar and I found out that, that highlighting and rereading are not effective. And actually, if they don't believe you, they can watch this webinar as well. And then say, there are better things that you can do and they're more likely to help you and you'll get better grades. And that's great for everyone. Now, this is known as a brain dump or blurting. I didn't come up with this name. This is really easy revision technique for students to use at home. And this is one of my students. To give you some context, she was in year 11 and this is her revision. All you need is a pen and paper, 
and it helps if you have your class book or your textbook to check later. So she didn't use her textbooks when she was doing this. All she had was her revision list, pen and paper. And at the top of her revision list, it said causes of the Vietnam conflict. She wrote it down in the middle of the page and then she thought about it and she wrote down everything she could remember about the causes. She wrote down the headings first of all uh, that you can see in pink. And then she thought, what can I remember about each of these? And she did it all from memory. Now, she didn't bring it to me to mark. And you might think, well, I want the teacher to check this. And well, I could, but it's better not just, you know, I'm not being lazy here. It's genuinely better for the student to self-assess it. And she did that. She got her textbook and notes and checked if this information was correct. And now it's better for her because then she can see for herself what she got right and where there's any gaps in her knowledge or any mistakes she made. And actually, this was really accurate. She was very proud. She thought, yes, I'm, I can retrieve information about the causes of the Vietnam conflict. I don't need to do any more study on this topic. I'll move on to the next point on my revision list. So the, this is not an expensive strategy, really low cost, minimal, pen and paper, and then a textbook to check. Now, if you see a piece of paper like this, but your child has copied the information from a textbook, that is not retrieval practice. That's copying. That's the same as highlighting, underlining. It's ineffective. It's got to be from memory. No notes. Flashcards, very popular. Now, I had a student once who had a stack of flashcards. They were beautiful, but they were covered and filled with text that they copied from a textbook. They literally copied it word for word and were rereading their flashcards. And it broke my heart to say, I know you spent hours on these flashcards, but they are not effective. And the student was really shocked. I said, I've told you about retrieval practice, not rereading your notes. Flashcards should have one question and one answer. And, and that's it. Or it could have a keyword and a definition. And my mantra to my students is flashcards don't need to be flashy. They could be on paper or they can be online. Um, it, it doesn't matter. Um, there's some that you can already buy. And if they are suitable for your exam course and syllabus, great. Be very careful. If you're studying English literature and your child is studying it with AQA and then you get an Edexcel set of flashcards, whilst the content should be the same, there might be some slight variations. So just double check the exam specification requirements. But the first thing with flashcards is they have to be used for retrieval practice, not rereading. So if a student has a flashcard, what they can't do is read the question, flip it over, say, yeah, I knew that. They haven't actually physically retrieved the information. What they should do if they're doing it independently, they read the question on the flashcard and then write the answer down. They turn the flashcard over, they can check the answer and they can put a tick or a cross. Now, the reason I suggest, and this is just my opinion, one question or one key term, is because I've seen flashcards with five questions on one card. And if they get three right, two wrong, they put them in a correct pile. But actually there's two that they got wrong. There's two they need to go back to and check. So that's why it's easier, one Q&A, one keyword definition. So once you have retrieved, then you can reflect. Which ones did you get wrong? Which ones did you get right? In terms of retrieval, if you want to get involved with and help, you can ask your child and they can verbally answer and you can check if the answer is similar on the flip side. It's also important to shuffle flashcards so students don't memorize them in a specific order. They need to actually be able to retrieve the answer with the question. And then keep repeating flashcards until they are mastered and retrieval strength is high, that your child can answer the flashcard questions correctly, quickly, confidently. And once you've mastered the flashcards, then your child can go on to answering past exam questions and past papers because they have the knowledge. They now then need to practice applying the knowledge and then they can do past exam questions in time conditions. So my top tips, as I've said, your child can create their own, um, but it is worth perhaps asking the teacher to check them, check for accuracy, if the questions uh, are relevant, if you're not sure. Um, as I said, keep them very simple. 
Um, you can use this. They can use it with parents. They can use it with siblings. They can use flashcards with friends or they can use it independently and just keep going with them. And the sooner that you make the flashcards, the better. We are currently in September. Now is a good time to make them because, and I say make them because you could be making a few flashcards each week. So often students wait until all their course is finished to then make the flashcards. That could be in March or April, and they've got their exams starting in May. So then they haven't got that much time to make the flashcards and they haven't got that much time to use them. But if they start now, they can do little and often. And that's really one of the best things that I think students could be doing now in terms of studying. Now, you can use paper flashcards. I like paper flashcards, but we know students love their phones and devices, and these are more practical. They might carry their phone with them all the time, more so than a pack of flashcards. So two that I would recommend are Quizlet and Anki. They have lots of pre-made flashcards. Your child could look, type in the topic, and they might type in you know, GCSE, they might have something biology or chemistry flashcards, and they can use them. Or they can create their own. So there's lots of benefits. However, if your child is using online apps, then encourage them to turn off their notifications because then we're going to go to the multitasking switch tasking where they're using Anki, they're answering questions and then they just have a Snapchat from their friend. So they go to Snapchat, they're having a conversation and they may forget about the flashcards or it's just interrupted their study session. So be careful of that. So lots of things we can do with retrieval practice, write it down, list keywords, list key quotes, sketch it, say it out loud, teach somebody else, do a brain dump, create a mind map from memory, answer a quiz, go back online, look at some of the activities your teacher set, try and complete them from memory, loads and loads of things that we can do. And the thing that we should do towards the end is pass papers. And teachers often do this with their students and their classes. You can access these online. Um, this is something that will come later on. And as the teacher is the best person to speak to because you've got to make sure that you're doing the right syllabus specification and the correct exam board. So why use retrieval practice if I haven't convinced you already? It shows your child what they know and what they don't know. And it shows you that as a parent, that you know, oh, well, actually, my child knows this. They're really strong on this area. They can recall it quickly, confidently, correctly. This is where there's a gap in their knowledge. This is the section that we need to focus on moving forwards. And of course, exams are stressful and difficult. So if we could do anything to reduce that stress, that's wonderful. And if we can increase the student confidence and change their attitude to learning, that they know how to learn, they know how to improve, they know what they need to do, then that can really help them to become independent, lifelong learners. And they can use these strategies in university or any stage in their life. Now, if you do want more retrieval practice ideas and techniques, this is the book. Because my books are written for teachers. I haven't authored a, a book for parents, but this book does have a chapter on revision techniques and it has other techniques that can be used at home as well. This is available at johncat.com or Amazon. Just remember the little blue book. That is the book. <laughs> so now space practice. Again, a huge amount of research to support this. And if we had two students who wanted to spend five hours studying and one student spent five hours studying on a Sunday night, okay, the other student had spent five hours studying that week doing an hour a night. Now, they've both spent five hours revising. However, it's more likely the student who spaced out their study over the five nights will do better because they've done what we call spaced practice. And this is, we don't want students to cram retrieval, to do all the retrieval quizzing and brain dumps before the end. And imagine if you did a retrieval task the night before the exam, and then it shows you a gap in your knowledge. Well, you haven't got much time to close that gap because the exam is tomorrow. But imagine if you've been doing retrieval for months and you find that there's a gap in your knowledge and you think, oh, I was absent for that. or I didn't understand that. Well, now I've got enough time to talk to my teacher to revisit in the book, to check myself again next week. So these two really do complement each other well, but it's not easy. We do have to support students and your children. And the best way is to study early 
spread it out little and often so that we can avoid cramming. And the best way to do this is to be organized. And Mark Roberts authored a book for teachers called The Boy Question. And he said that even if we tell boys that retrieval and space practice is effective, no matter how much we go on about it, some of them will still resort to cramming because they struggle with organization. Now, this can also apply to girls as well, but there was a pattern that showed that boys struggled with organization. So that might be something we need to help them with, or a study schedule, a reminder, have it on the calendar, tell them, say, well, actually, you haven't done any studying this week. When are you doing it? And we can, you know, at home, keep an eye on that as well. Now, we've covered the effective strategies, just a few of the pointers. If your child says to you, I study better listening to music, that like lots of people do, tell them, nope, nope, I insist, revise in silence. Music can be great. When you're at the gym, it motivates you. You might have your running playlist. You might hear a song on the radio that makes you happy or it makes you sad for whatever reason. But when it comes to learning, again, the research was clear. Lots of studies have been carried out looking at students who revise in silence, who revise with music and no lyrics, who revise with music and lyrics. And guess what? The groups who study in silence perform better, significantly better. So whilst music can be calming and relaxing and motivating, when they're studying, silence is golden. Phones can be used for flashcards and quizzing, but they're also a huge distraction. It's a good idea to completely have your phone away or take your child's phone off them if they'll let you, because it's a I struggle as an adult with self-regulation. But just before a study session, tell them not to post anything or message anyone. Because if they've just messaged someone, they might be waiting for their reply. If they posted something online, they might be thinking, I wonder if anyone's liked it or viewed it or commented. So they really do need to be very disciplined with their phones. It's not easy to do. We know this as adults, so we have to support them as best we can. And I've touched upon this already, but I get asked a lot, is there a difference, boys and girls and so on? And no, there's no cognitive differences. Retrieval practice works just as well for boys as it does with girls. There is research that says that boys struggle with organisation. Um, there's also research about the confidence gap where boys can overestimate their abilities. So they may feel they don't need to study because they believe they know it. But believing it is not the same as actually checking. And retrieval practice will show them if they know it or not. Girls can struggle with the, the lack of confidence and retrieval practice should help them with their confidence. There you go. Look at what you can recall from memory. You do know this. So if they're doubting themselves. But that doesn't apply for all boys and all girls, these are just patterns. Something else, just a few other pointers, sleep is so, so important. And there really is a sleep crisis with teenagers staying awake very late. Perhaps parents aren't always aware of this because they're in their bedroom, but might be on their phone or gaming. And that can have a negative impact on their concentration, attention and memory and their overall performance in an exam. Students really do need to eat breakfast. Please encourage them, give them a cereal bar. Again, there's research to support this that is way more important than we realise, especially the days of the exam. And encourage your child to exercise, even if they're not sporty, just to go for a walk. And I taught a student and I remember her saying, oh, I've stopped playing netball because I just want to focus on my studies. And I think she thought I'd be really happy about that. And I said, no, 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 please don't do that. She said, why, miss? I'm just wanting to devote all my time to studying. Isn't that a good thing? No, you need to exercise. There are so many physical and mental health benefits of exercising. Nothing should stop you, especially not revision. So try and get these healthy diets and exercise routines that they keep doing them, that they don't put them to a halt. And I'm sure you wouldn't, but as a parent, don't stop them. Don't say, no, you're not allowed to play football. You've got to study. You've got to actually play football and study. That's what it should be. Um, something else that I'm aware of that you may or may not be aware of, and that's study tubers. And I have mixed feelings about these. They are young people who are ultimately really inspiring people. They are students who tend to be about 18 and university age, and they go on YouTube and they give study tips. 
and they make studying cool. It's not something to be embarrassed about. You're not swatty, geeky, nerdy, and they love to study. They love their subjects. They're passionate. And for that, I admire them so much. However, and your child might go on YouTube and think, type in study techniques, tips, revision tips, and then they might see the study tubers because they have hundreds of thousands of subscribers and they are really popular. But my word of caution is to be careful. They are not trained teachers. They often haven't engaged with the research. Some of them have, and I will give them credit, but not all of them. And they don't always offer really good advice. Sometimes they do suggest cramming and sometimes they suggest blocking studying in, in heavy topics for a long period of time. And they're not, they might have the grades, but they are not the best people that always to give the advice. And we do have to be careful. So if your child says, well, I watch a YouTube video and this person got full marks and this person's at this university and they said I should highlight my notes. Well, they may have highlighted their notes. They probably would have used other strategies. But again, just be careful. It's, we know highlighting is not effective unless it's your starting point later followed by retrieval. Um, and I created this graphic to show that actually to be successful isn't just retrieval practice and space practice. Yes, they're important, but there's other elements. And if we take any of these away, then that could have a negative impact on the overall results. So the first point is attendance. And I know that we've experienced COVID and I'm an ambassador for a bereavement charity. So I completely understand that there will be times where children are absent from school. But 90% on a test is a great score. 90% absence is not good. 10% of learning has been lost. That is a huge amount of content that needs to be caught up on. So where possible, really in try to ensure good attendance. I know parents who let their children have school days off for birthdays. Now that is not allowed. And also, why are they doing that? Saying, oh, your birthday's on Tuesday, you can have the day off, stay at home or go out. No, it's really not allowed. And if they miss time, and I'm not talking here about illness or a bereavement or another serious issue, I'm talking about other things, then that really can lead to lower results because there could be gaps in their knowledge that they never close. It could be something that's taught that day that is a question on the exam. So really try and support your school and, and your child with good attendance. Students need support from us as teachers, the pastoral team, the head of year, the form tutor, and of course, at home. It's a difficult time. And if they don't have that support network around them, they may be anxious and that could have a negative impact on their memory and performance. Sometimes though, we don't know the students that need support. Sometimes it's very clear. It's very visible. They are crying. You can see the stress and anxiety. We can intervene. But there are times where teachers and parents, we miss this because the child looks like they are coping really well. So we need to just have regular check-ins, even if everything seems fine. Say, how are you? Is everything okay? And encourage them to ask for help if they need it. There was a research paper that was published in, um, in America about university students and it showed what something that the top students all had in common was that they asked for help when they needed it. They weren't shy or afraid to. They went and found their professors and asked for clarification or support. Um, they probably had the confidence to do that and, and that's something that they had in common. Now, the word mindset could be attitude, effort. As teachers, as parents, there is only so much we can do. We could be really supportive and wonderful and kind and caring. We should be all those things, but we can't sit the exams for our child, for our students. They have to put in the effort and the work and they need to understand that. And if they don't, then they likely won't achieve their potential and they'll probably underperform. And if they don't use retrieval and space practice, then again, they probably won't get the results that they hope for and that you hope they get, then they're all, if they do, they'll have to use ineffective strategies that take a huge amount of time and effort and they could resort to very stressful cramming. So learning does happen over time and forgetting is normal. It's part of the learning process. If you're completing retrieval tasks, flashcards or quizzing and your child doesn't know, don't panic. 
everybody forgets things. We do not expect students to be taught something and they just remember everything perfectly the first time round. It would be wonderful if learning happens that way, but it doesn't. So don't panic. Just make a note of where the gaps are and then next time revisit that, focus on closing those gaps. Retrieval practice shows what we know and don't know. If you want some uh, more recommended reading, these are not books I've written, but they're books I would highly recommend. Patrice Bain has authored a book for parents about retrieval practice, space practice, what you can do. And she's a really experienced, wonderful teacher, a celebrated author. Uh, I, I think she's wonderful, um, a brilliant book. And then The Learning Scientists, you can check out their free resources on their website, learningscientists.org, resources for students, parents, teachers. Their book, Ace That Test, is written for students. It does explain the research behind it. It does give tips and techniques and strategies. Another really good book. And again, once students understand this, they can use it through the GCSEs, through their A-levels at university, or if they're trying to learn a language, or a master's, a PhD, all sorts of things throughout their life. So thank you very much for listening. I hope this was interesting and helpful ultimately. Here's my details, uh, Kate Jones underscore teach Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook page, Kate Jones teaching. All of these um, I have messaging on so you can contact me. If you're not on social media, don't worry. Um, my website, love to teach 87.com has a contact me page. You can send me a message on there. I mean, I am on maternity leave, so I can't guarantee that I will reply quickly because my beautiful baby girl <laughs> takes up a lot of time. I will absolutely uh, do my best. And best of luck to you supporting your child and best of luck to your student with their lifelong learning. Thank you again.